Good afternoon. The next topic in our avian physiology series is sound production and hearing. In this presentation, we will cover the following topics, history and discoveries, physiology of avian sound production, comparison to humans, differences between species, methods of analysis, hearing and ear anatomy, how and what birds hear, and echolocation. To start, we will take a look back at the history of sound production in birds. It was first discovered that birds have a unique sound organ other than the larynx when in 1646, M. Duverney surprisingly noted that a beheaded chicken could still make sounds. Birds produce sound using a unique avian organ called the syrinx. More about this organ will be discussed later in the presentation. Upon discovery of the syrinx, scientists such as Crawford Geenwald began a lot of research on the acoustic properties of this organ. In 1968, Geenwald published his findings as what is still considered the most comprehensive analysis of avian song production. He analyzed the function of syringeal anatomy and song generation, providing a basis for future research. A prominent theory today, known as the two-voice theory, is related to the structure of the syrinx. In this theory, Songbirds are capable of producing two sounds simultaneously. Supported with oscillograms and spectrograms, the two-voice theory explains the amazing ability of songbirds to produce two-tone calls. To fully understand birds' interesting method of communication, we must look at the entire pathway of one bird sending a signal and another bird receiving that signal. First, we will learn about the mechanism by which the signal is produced. Using their voice box, or syrinx, birds produce a variety of sounds, such as pure tone whistles, tones with clearly defined harmonics, broadband sounds with format-like structures, coupled amplitude and frequency modulations, click-like sounds, and other assorted noises. Avian sound production is largely rooted in the two-voice theory, where the membranous portions of the syrinx are activated and controlled independently. Let's take a look at the morphology of the syrinx to more easily understand this avian ability. This is a diagram of a bird syrinx. As you can see in the image, the syrinx is bipartite, so there is a separate sound source on each side that can be controlled independently by the brain. In fact, some songbirds can sing two completely harmonically unrelated notes simultaneously, one on each side of the syrinx. For instance, in a tenth of a second, the northern cardinal spans a wider range of pitches than a piano by switching between sides of the syrinx pathway, and the brown thrasher sings two swooping tones at the same time. To learn more about how different species utilize the two song sides to make their songs, I highly suggest visiting this website and watching the syrinx animations. The syrinx is a bony structure surrounded by an air sac. It is composed of ossified cartilages, vibrating membranes, and muscles. Let's take a look at the in situ location of the syrinx in birds. The syrinx is located in the thoracic cavity at the junction of the trachea and primary bronchi. This position gives birds the ability to use both the right and left bronchus for breathing and phonation or sound production. The location of the syrinx or sound organ in birds is different from that in humans. In humans, the voice mechanism is called the larynx. The larynx is located at the cranial end of the air passage or trachea, whereas the syrinx is located at the caudal end. Because the syrinx is located where the bird's windpipe branches to its lungs, birds can make more than one pitch at a time, which humans cannot do. However, the caudal position of the vocal organ in birds does present a problem. Because of its position at the end of the trachea, the syrinx does not provide protection of the airways such as the larynx provides. As you likely already know from experience, different types of birds produce different sounds. A portion of the reasoning for this is attributed to the physiology of the syrinx. First of all, the structure of the syrinx allows for multiple uses or functions. Phonation, or sound production, may be bilateral or unilateral. In bilateral production, both sides of the syrinx are utilized, and in unilateral production, one side of the syrinx is closed, so sound is only generated on the other side. 
Furthermore, some species have differences in their syringeal anatomy. One example is that songbirds have more extrinsic muscles than non-songbirds. Additionally, some birds have the same syringeal anatomy, but use one side of the syrinx more than the other for sound production. When birds, such as canaries, do this, they are termed peripherally lateralized for sound production. To understand the different types of sounds that can be produced, let's listen to the sounds of a chicken, songbird, and parrot. That is the sound of a chicken. Here's a songbird. In the songbird, you can hear the simultaneous two tones from the syrinx. With this parrot, you can hear its typical bird sounds as well as other sounds, such as the word hi, that it has learned in its captive environment. We will discuss more about how birds learn sounds later in this presentation. The syrinx is small and located deep within the thoracic cavity, so it is difficult to extensively research sound production. Two main methods of analysis are a miniature thermistor, which monitors airflow while recording acoustic signals, and a quantitative kinematic analysis, which analyzes the motions of the vocal tract. Here is an example of a quantitative kinematic analysis. This video of the syrinx is imaged under trans illumination. You can see the bony structure of the syrinx as well as the membranes. Studies like this one helped researchers discover that birds use the same physical mechanism to produce sound, despite their differing vocal organs. The oscillations you see are producing sound pulses in the same way that vocal cords do in humans. This discovery was made only three years ago and has prompted researchers to look at the knowledge along with vocal mechanisms. With that relation in mind, we will transition into hearing. Next to sight, hearing is a bird's most important sense. Birds' earlobes are funnel-shaped to focus sound and distinguish frequencies in different calls. Birds' ears are located on the side of their head directly below their eyes. You can see that pretty clearly in this photo. The ears are protected by soft feathers called auriculars. The shape of a bird's head can also impact a way the bird hears. For example, Owls have a face that's more round, which can help direct sound towards their ears, which are in a different location, slightly different location, as you can see here. Owls also have these ear tufts on top of their head. These could be confused for ears themselves. However, these ear tufts have nothing to do with hearing at all. As this picture over here depicts, owls' earlobes are directly behind the eye and is similar in funnel shape to other birds. It's also worth mentioning that chickens and other poultry animals have similar ear and earlobe placements as wild birds. The anatomy of an avian ear is similar to that of the mammalian ear. The ear is also an organ of hearing and balance in avians. The ear is composed of three parts, the outer, the middle, and the inner ear. The outer ear is composed of just the ear canal. Humans have a pinna to protect the ear canal. The pinna is the flap on your earlobe protecting the ear canal and the inner parts of the ear from things getting inside. Birds do not have this. Instead of a pinna, birds have a, the specialized feathers called auricular feathers. The auricular feathers protect the inside of the ear from foreign debris, just like the pinna in humans. The middle ear consists of the eardrum and three tiny bones called the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. These three bones make up the ossicles. 
The ocellus function is to amplify sound vibrations and send the vibrations to the cochlea in the inner ear. The inner ear is made up of the vestibule, the semicircular canals, and the cochlea. The inner ear can also be called the labyrinth part of the ear. The cochlea is the snail-shaped structure, and I would argue that it's the most important structure when recognizing sound. It is important to note that it is filled with fluid. The fluid is what makes sound waves move on sensory hairs. The cochlea is divided up into an upper and lower part. The upper part is what is circled in black, and then this is a close-up image of what's inside. Sensory cells near the wide end of the cochlea, so the outermost part, upper and lower, detect higher pitch sound, while the, sensory, while the center sensory cells detect lower pitch sounds. The midline, this red line, of the cochlea is called the bacillar membrane. Movement on the bacillar membrane is what allows the bird to hear. Now that we have an understanding of where things are and their functions, let's talk about how it all works together. Sound waves enter through the outer ear and travel through the ear canal, leading to the middle ear. Here, the sound waves hit the eardrum, which vibrates, and the vibrations will be sent to the ossicles. The ossicles send the vibrations to the bacillar membrane on the cochlea. Once sound vibrations cause the fluid in the co cochlea to move, sensory cells move up the sound wave. So let's take a closer look at the upper part of the co cochlea. The sensory cells in this part of the ear are also called hair cells, located here as the outer hair cells and the inner hair cells. As the hair cells move up and down from vibrations, the sound wave hits even smaller hairs that are on top of these original hair cells called stereocilum. These are the blue lines right here on top of the hair cells. The stereocilum bump into each other and bend. When these hairs bend, it, is, it causes pore sized channels at the very tip of the stereocilum to open up. When these open up, chemicals go into the sensory cells, creating an electrical signal. The auditory nerve then carries the electrical signal to the brain, which is then able to recognize and understand a sound. Birds are able to distinguish sounds much easier than humans do. However, they have a much smaller frequency range than we do. Earlier we mentioned different birds have different sounds, songs, and calls. Birds use these variations to recognize other individual birds using their sensitivity to pitch, tone, and rhythm changes. Being able to determine these different calls, even among their own breed, can show a sign of a warning for a predator, showing a claim of territory, or offering food to share, and many other reasons. Understanding these calls can help people identify birds as well as understand the bird's behavior. Some birds, however, cannot hear at all, specifically oil birds, who use echolocation. Oil birds are a species that are found in the northern areas of South America. The birds that use echolocation make echolocating sounds in their larynx, this part of the voice box. They then emit these waves through their mouth. Most of these sound waves are too high pitched for humans to hear. Some birds can scream up to 140 decibels. To put that in perspective, that is as loud as a jet engine that is 30 miles away. Echolocation works by making an animal, click, by an animal making a clicking noise that will create sound waves. This diagram on the left indicates the movement of sound waves. The orange waves indicate the animal giving off the echolocation and the sound waves coming from the animal. The sound wave then bounces off objects of different sizes and returns the sound wave back to the sender, which is represented by these blue waves. The highlighted part of the brain in this diagram, the foremost part, shows that this is the part of the brain that is able to receive the sound waves. Since birds are very sensitive to high-pitched sounds, it's imperative that they protect themselves while creating these waves. 
When birds create echolocations, they can turn off the middle part of their ear and then they're quickly able to restore it in order to listen for the return echoes. And these are our sources.